Their goal is to control human behavior. That is the whole purpose of this entire system. They want to dominate all habitable portions of the world, and that means they have to control human beings. You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome, friends. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com coming to you in a conversation that's being recorded on the 11th of April, 2016. I keep doing that. I will get that by the end of the year, I'm sure. Uh, Today, we're going to be talking to Joe Plummer, a person that you may have heard of before uh, from a couple of interviews he's done in some various alt media places that you're probably familiar with if you're familiar with The Corbett Report, like Tragedy and Hope or the Our Interesting Times podcast. And he is, well, he's making the rounds talking about a book that he has written recently called Tragedy and Hope 101, The Illusion of Justice, Freedom, and Democracy, a very interesting book that we're going to talk more about. You can find out more directly via tragedyandhope.info, not .com, .info, or via his main site, joeplummer.com. The link will be in the show notes as always. Joe Plummer, thank you for joining us today on the program. Happy to be with you, James. All right. And also, for just for your the sake of the audience at home, if you hear any typing and clattering in the background, I have video editor Brock West here in Japan for a couple of weeks, so he's actually going to be working as we talk. So that will explain the little clattering if you hear that in the background. But let's get to the meat and potatoes of the conversation. Joe Plummer, you have written an extremely valuable book an extremely valuable book that talks about another book. Another book that will be very familiar to most of my listeners, I'm sure, Tragedy and Hope by Carol Quigley. And I'm sure, again, a lot of the listeners will already have heard about this book, will already know something about it, but all the people in the audience who have actually read the book cover to cover, please raise your hands. Don't worry, don't be shy if you're not raising your hand right now, because I'm not raising my hand either. I have not read Tragedy and Hope cover to cover. I've read sections and passages and parts of it, but I haven't read the whole thing, because it is humongous. It is an overwhelming tome, and to be fair, 95% of it, as Joe points out in his introduction to the book, is not amazing, bold, you know, conspiracy, blowing, uh, incredible information. 95% of it is just kind of boring, dry history, and 5% is really juicy nuggets that reveal a very different story. So, Joe, thank you very much for writing this book, first of all. First of all, why don't you introduce yourself and how you came to to work on this project? Why did you decide to do this? Well, uh, I decided to do it because the information was so terribly important. And, as you just stated, it's buried in a 1,300-page textbook that is the equivalent, really, if it was normal-sized print, of about 2,000 pages. So, how many people really have the time to sift through all of that data and find this extremely important information? So, the the purpose of the book, really, is to provide a a very easy way for people to uh, meet Carol Quigley and the illegitimate form of government that he exposed, buried in between all of that other information. So um, I've written a few books. Our, the first book was uh, mostly about our fraudulent monetary system. The second book, that was Dishonest Money, then Leaving the Illusion, which is a novel uh, about the mindset of these people who engage in real politic and they, they believe in a political philosophy that's unbound by any moral dimension at all. Uh, so that, that's what was covered in that, but then clearly uh, Tragedy and Hope uh, 101 was uh, an attempt to expose the fraudulent political system itself because that is so important for people to understand that it is fraudulent and it was created specifically to, to confuse them, to make them believe that, that it's a representative government, that they have some hand in it, but Quigley shows step by step how these people created that fraud and how they exploit everybody uh, by continuing to lead them to believe that that's uh, that they have some say in it. He certainly does. And as I say, that is a story, the broad outlines of which will be familiar to a lot of people who are watching this uh, video right now. But then again, there are people out there, always new people tuning in, who may not know the story of Carol Quigley and Tragedy and Hope. So perhaps you can just give us the short summary of the network that Carol Quigley wrote about and to a certain extent exposed in his writing and why it's important that it was exposed by this Georgetown uh, professor. It, it's just, I think, really the biggest part about Carol Quigley... Uh, It boils down to credentials that he brings to the table. This is one of the most respected historians of the 20th century. 
And um, when a man with his credentials, you know, he earned his PhD at Harvard, he taught at Princeton, he taught at Georgetown University, he advised the Department of Defense, he advised the Smithsonian Institute, you know, he's, he is a very well-connected, well-credentialed Ivy League historian. So when somebody of that caliber who has spent decades of his life studying the true nature of the evolution of civilizations and how power actually operates versus how it's presented to the electorate. When someone of that caliber comes to the table and says, okay, not only is it not uncommon for secret societies, his term, and, and small, secret, powerful groups to act behind the scenes and control nations, there is such a secret society that I was actually close to, that I actually worked with, and that I was allowed to uh, examine their secret papers for a couple years. And this is how they uh, established their control of our nation. And the interesting thing about Quigley really is rather than going through, you know, some have just demonized him. I'm very grateful for his work because it's so important. But, you know, he seems conflicted. He was sucked into that... Um, uh, elitist intelligentsia space. So he clearly identified with that in some way. So in one breath, he's saying, uh, of course, the two parties are the same. You, the, the, two, the two parties need to be the same because that way the electorate, the angry electorate can throw the, the, you know, any side out at any time, but it doesn't lead to any shift in policy that the experts have decided on. But then he starts to backtrack a little bit from that. And he starts to say, well, you know, I, I hope some semblance of freedom will remain for the average person because, you know, this is just something that would be nice. And then he goes full circle. By the time you get to the Anglo-American establishment, he says, what these people have accomplished is terrifying. That's his word, terrifying. I'm not, I mean, that's right out of his own, uh, you know, out of the text in, in uh, the Anglo-American establishment. So he, he's really, he, he runs the gamut, I suppose, from, from one side to the other on this. And, and that in itself, that story itself is part of why this is so important. You need to, you need to acknowledge that this guy was t torn himself, and yet he, he obviously did the right thing and, and uh, gave us some priceless insight. That's right. And I did do a podcast episode years and years and years ago about the Carol Quigley story and Tragedy and Hope. And I included some of the, the, the interview that was taken by, I believe, a student reporter back in the 1970s talking right. about his struggle even to try to get the, the plates so that he could do a new reprinting of Tragedy and mm -hmm. Hope and all of that kind of story. It's, it's interesting stuff. And of course, I'll throw in the links to your previous conversations with uh, Richard Grove and Tim Kelly and other people so they can get sort of the bigger handle on the bigger picture. But today I wanted to hone in on some of the specifics. Again, we're talking about this network that uh, Quigley wrote about and identified, and he talked about the main members and how it came together with Cecil Rhodes and Alfred Milner and the Oxford mm -hmm. University set and all of that. But let's talk about some of the specific things that they were involved with over the years and decades so that we can get a sense of how this group operated, at least in the early part of the 20th century, um, sure. at the time that Quigley was covering. And I wanted to start with a, a part of history that kind of predates the network and, mm -hmm. and to according a certain extent to where he is. by it. But yeah, according to when he starts. Sure. Exactly, according to when he starts. But uh, it's such an interesting thing for me here in Japan, living in a society that clearly has been under imperial conditioning for a long time, and you tend to think that that's just, that's just always been that way and it's just been a natural evolution of society. Not so, according to Carol Quigley, who disrupts the usual narrative of the Meiji Restoration, that it was Commodore Perry showing up with the gunboats and saying, you guys better modernize, and the Japanese all just spontaneously rallied around the emperor and became an industrial nation. Not quite that way, and in fact, uh, the nation was very much shaped and brainwashed into the pliant and pliable uh, society that it is today by the forcing of the Shinto ideology. Let's talk about that. I think, again, extremely interesting little nugget that Quigley drops. I wanted to put that in there, even though it doesn't directly relate to how the network took control of the United States and how they used the British Empire to uh, facilitate their objective to gain control of all habitable portions of the world. That's very important. But the reason uh, I wanted to include the Meiji Restoration is because it, it really, it, again, it establishes that this is simply how it works, that real power prefers anonymity. 
It wants to be, uh, you know, real power is being able to act without, especially coerce, without suffering the consequences of those actions. And so that's what makes it real power. It's unaccountable. You can't, it, there's nothing above it. So secrecy is the best way to maintain that level of power. So here you have the big story of the um, Emperor Meiji coming back to power and, you know, wresting control away from the Shogun and everything is back the way it's supposed to be. The Shinto ideology, abject um, uh, fealty to the emperor. And, and really, when you dig deeper into it, you find that, that not even just the Meiji oligarchy, which uh, Quigley points out, he says the Meiji oligarchy creates this massive government uh, system, this massive bureaucracy. So uh, the department of this the Bureau of that. Does it sound familiar? This is how they're going to administer everything, okay, and that they pay themselves, obviously, from the, uh, from, the, from the money collected, and they create a new imperial army and an imperial navy. So once they have all of these things created, they create a whole new line of nobility, which their supporters are going to be the ones who are filling this. And, and so after they've created this entire system, this handful of people create this entire system, then out comes the constitution and representative government and all of these other things to really put that final layer of the facade over this entire sham so that they can rule in the emperor's name, as quickly puts it, rule in the emperor's name and in his shadow. And everybody else thinks that, you know, again, this is, this is the whole trick. This is the thing that we desperately need people to understand. It isn't hyperbole to say representative government is nothing but a carefully managed con game. That is all it is. That is what it was, in, from the point of these people gaining control, that is what they intended it to be. So, again, the Meiji Restoration, very important. And then what's even more interesting, I think, I throw this little piece of the, the puzzle in there, is that it wasn't even just the Meiji oligarchy. It was a small group of men, less than a dozen, who were really called the Genro, who were really in control of everything. So say this to the average Japanese citizen back in the 1870s, 1880s, that everything that they believe and everything that they're fighting for and everything that they think is legitimate about their government is a complete and total scam managed by a dozen or fewer men. What's going to happen? Not likely to believe that. Conspiracy theorist. If yeah, they had such yeah. a word back at that time, they would have used sure, it, I'm sure. sure. And then the men with the guns will come and, and deal with the people who are saying such heretical things about the emperor and exactly, his government. Exactly, yeah. Off with their heads or some version thereof. Exactly right. Again, and, and I, I can say, I mean, I live this experience here on a daily basis. That conditioning that they instituted through the Shinto and the, the idea of complete fealty and allegiance to the emperor, that still exists. It's not quite to the emperor so much anymore, but it's the same thing. And the Zaibatsu in the post-war era were just reorganized versions of the same families that were ruling before. Now they're just corporations that are ruling, and it's still a very organized society. So that really spoke to me when I was reading about that. Um, again, extremely important, but extremely glossed period of history that uh, that Quigley was digging up. Let's So let's turn to the network itself that he was talking about, that he identified coming together at the end of the 19th century, really starting to take shape in the early 20th century. We've talked about so many of its organs before in so many different ways in the podcast before, like the CFR, which of course Quigley identifies as being a front for J.P. Morgan and company. No surprise yeah. there. But let's talk about one of their, their first real big political coups in the United States. Let's talk about the, the coming to power of, uh, of the network through the political apparatus and how they helped you know, make machinations and split votes and things to try to get uh, people they didn't like out of power and people they did want into power. Let's talk about the 1912 coup. Sure. And well, there, and there was really, it was going on in France as well, where they were trying to get uh, Poincaré, I hope I'm pronouncing his name properly, uh, appointed to the presidency in France. So they're doing the same thing in France, greasing the skids, buying off, uh, buying off the uh, journalists bribing people and doing what they do, but in the United States specifically, here they have Taft, who's heavily favored to win, and Taft has already rejected one of the main uh, instruments that they so desperately need, which Quigley himself admits, which is control of our monetary system, where he says the central banks were created specifically to dominate the, the governments of the nation states, and this is something Taft wasn't going along with, 
but Woodrow Wilson was more than happy to go along with. So in order to bring Taft to power, they uh, wheeled out one of their old hat tricks, which was dividing the, the vote. They bring Teddy Roosevelt back in, finance him heavily, and by the end, by the time all the dust clears, now Woodrow Wilson, who would have been uh, defeated handily by Taft, Taft was very heavily favored to win, Woodrow Wilson ends up winning, Teddy Roosevelt comes in second, and Taft, the guy who would have won, winds up dead last. And then the rest, as they say, from there is history. This is where they get the income tax. This is where they, they get the Federal Reserve System. These are the two funding mechanisms that they needed to really uh, unleash the power of this, this, uh, this, this goal that they had. Without it, you know, without those confiscated trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars over the past hundred years or so, would have been a lot less effective in what they were trying to achieve. Having a wrecker come in to split the Republican vote to make sure that their candidate gets in on the other side of the equation, hmm, sounds like an election cycle that I'm, I'm reading about in the news every day, but uh, interesting to see that the same tricks were at work 100 years ago, and unfortunately, very, very effective. And, of course, we all know what happened in the first year of the Wilson presidency, the Federal Reserve, so the consolidation of control uh, right from the get-go. Um, a fascinating, again, another fascinating period of history. Uh, another thing that leaps out at me is another specific point that we can talk about that, again, is it still, to this day, considered crazy conspiracy theorizing if you talk about it, but Quigley was writing about it decades and decades ago. The IPR, the Institute for Pacific Relations. What is this group? Why was it important? And why have we never heard of it in, uh, in terms of what, it was, uh, what was uncovered about it during Senate investigations? To me, the thing that's most important about the IPR is, again, it provides a beautiful example illustrated by Quigley how a small group of people can secretly create an institute, the Institute of Pacific Relations, and this is the network who created it. So it's the same people. Nobody knows these people exist. Nobody knows these people are controlling it. But still, they create this institute that essentially controls Far East policy for the United States, specifically with regard to China, is, is where the, the most of the, uh, you know, the, the problem uh, was, uh, most of the issues with regard to the Senate investigations and everything else, there were a lot of people very disturbed about how this small group was able to affect the policy toward China. But, but anyway, that's what kind of prompted a lot of it. But the real key here, the thing that's so important about it, is the fact that he goes step by step through the process of how they're able to control, if, if you want to be a specialist, so like this is what you want to be as a specialist on the Far East. Well, guess what? If you want your work to be published, if you want to have some kind of academic position granted to you, if you want to have a job and be paid, if you want positions in the State Department, then you have to follow this line, this, this, uh, this line established by the IPR, because if you don't, you will not get anywhere. So by controlling the flow of funds and controlling the consensus, which they created behind the scenes secretly without anybody knowing it, the network was able to completely guide the, the nation's foreign policy with regard to the Far East. And that, again, sounds like something that most people would think is a complete conspiracy theory. How can, how can this be possible that one group would be able to control all of these, all of this, these great intellectual minds. Well, the first thing that you might want to look for when, uh, when something is being blasted out through the megaphone of the establishment is look for absolute consensus. Look for absolute consensus because that in and of itself says something about what's going on behind the scenes. It is not impossible, and the IPR is important because it shows perfectly. You want to be published, if you want to get grants, if you want career advancement, if you want an academic post or you want to work in the State Department, this handful of people created the institution. You have to do what they want you to do. That's simple. And, of course, the IPR story dovetails in with my work on China and the New World Order. Oops, well, wouldn't you know it, China becomes this communist uh, enemy, quote-unquote, uh, frenemy, sure. whatever they are, exactly. So, he addresses uh, yeah. that, too. 
I mean, there's so many different pieces of this puzzle, but as you say, in some ways, what they do is they create the dark mirror of what we experience in our own lives. We all have common sense that we use as basic templates for how we orient ourselves in the world. These are just things that people know intuitively or they learn from a very early age, and thus it becomes just the way that they inter interact with the world. They want to mirror that. The, the dark mirror side of that is the common sense of the consensus view that everyone just learns from the time they're young because it's part of the curriculum and every Every, their teachers learned it, they learn it, they make it into the common sense view of the world that doesn't really make sense if you start to peel away the layers, but who wants to do that? Who wants to trouble everything they've learned by peeling away the layers? So it's, it's extremely effective. It speaks to a, a deep understanding of the human psychology about the ways that they can control it by creating these, these institutions that mirror what we do in real life. Now, the, the part of that that's interesting to me is that you don't you don't create such such ideas and such elaborate, large, detailed, intricate plans with so many moving parts that all work together towards the same propagandistic um, uh, uh, goals, unless you are an extremely intelligent and extremely, uh, what other word is, is there for it? Evil schemer. I mean, someone who has a goal of trying to control as many people as possible and works concertedly towards that. Can you speak to the, the mentality of the, the network and the people behind it. That is the key right there, is that their goal is to control human behavior. That is the whole purpose of this entire system. They want to dominate all habitable portions of the world, and that means they have to control human beings. So as you stated, uh, very few people want to peel back the, the layers of the onion and look, well, they're conditioned from day one not to. What, what incentive is there in school, in an indoctrination center, to, to challenge anything that you're taught? The people who challenge don't get ahead. The people who go along and, and parrot whatever they're taught are the ones who get the gold stars and then the ones who are told that they are smart and the ones who are going to advance through the system and, and become the administrators of this, especially at the higher levels. But the, the mindset of these individuals really, I think, is best um, summarized in, in the word of just, they're just sociopaths, or you can use the word psychopaths. They do not believe in any moral dimension. They believe, as E.H. Carr, which was a prominent historian, a member of, of the network, stated that there is no moral dimension. This is kind of the concept of real politic. Uh, what works is what is right. And what doesn't work is what is wrong. So if you have an objective, what matters is that you achieve your objective. The, the, the legislative and moral laws that other people are expected to abide by absolutely do not apply. Again, this is not hyperbole. This is out of their own mouths. And even if you didn't hear them speak it, look at the things that they do. Look at Operation Gladio. Look at, look at the, their plans for uh, just Operation Northwoods. Very uncontroversial. Go read Operation Northwoods and try to get yourself into the mind of an individual who's going to create what would clearly be seen, if anybody were to expose it, as an absolutely ludicrous conspiracy theory. Fake planes, 200 fake CIA passengers loaded under fake names and flown to Eglin Air Force Base where the plane will be replaced by an exact, exact duplicate, uh, a CIA drone that will then be detonated via remote control after a fake Mayday signal. It sounds ridiculous. This is an official U.S. government document that went all the way to the president's desk and not, you know, a lot of people say, yeah, but Limnitzer was punished for that. Limnitzer wasn't punished. He was made Supreme Allied Commander of NATO which is where Operation Gladio was happening. So it's not like if you or I conspired, and there's also, that's all part of a larger, uh, larger series of plans that they had to, to go us into war with, with Cuba at the time. But if you or I did something like that, if we were actually conspiring to, to, to facilitate terror attacks, to fake terror attacks, all these things that they were, they were doing, I think we would uh, face something more than a promotion the Supreme Allied Commander of NATO. Well, actually, maybe oh, they'd I scout know. us for uh, for inclusion in NATO. You're right. That's I mean, it, it's not just the end ends justify the means or the might makes right, which are uh, I mean, completely morally repulsive philosophies in and of themselves. But 
it's not just that because it's also a question, well, okay, well, what are the ends that they are seeking? Uh, what, what are they actually going for? And in every case, it's just more power and control for themselves and their network and their interests. And uh, to hell with the rest of humanity who are just, just pawns on the chessboard. That's all power we are is, to them. Power is the end. Yes. That's the end that they, they aim for. Well, extremely important. Does, uh, d- d- does Quigley get to that inner part of the mentality, or does he just gesture at the way that this functions? He's very reluctant. He, um, you know, everything I've gone, obviously, I read, I've gone through all of this stuff with Tragedy and Hope and the Anglo-American establishment and even evolution of civilizations. And um, I didn't, like I said, one of the most striking things that he said was that this is terrifying and it's too much. I think that's about as far as he could allow himself to go. And he was very critical and said that they were careless and did things that they shouldn't do and and all this. But I think, you know, at least in the pages of those books, he hadn't quite got to the point where he had in his own mind established that, yes, these are just psychopaths who are manipulating everybody, including the intelligentsia, with all of these visions of how we're going to eliminate war and make the world safe for democracy and all of these slogans. Now, I have read but haven't confirmed that toward the end that uh, somebody close to Quigley confided to Gary Allen, who, who, was, who was obviously very important in, in revealing this information back in the 70s, that Quigley had, especially after his work was suppressed and he started facing all of the, 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 the uh, repercussions of what he revealed that they did. And he hadn't even released Anglo-American establishment yet. This was just from Tragedy and Hope. Anglo-American establishment is very, very specific, which wasn't published until you know, he died. But um, anyway, that, that uh, somebody, had, somebody close to Quigley had told Gary Allen that he confided that he, he, was, he was wrong, that, that they're after something that's not what they claim it to be. Interesting stuff, but uh, I guess we'll have to leave that uh, unfoot footnoted as it as it may be. But uh, that's, I mean, yeah. it's interesting to, to to hear about that. And it would be very interesting if some intrepid journalist, if there are any left in the world, would uh, approach Bill Clinton on the Hillary campaign trail with questions about his mentor, who he name checked when he was getting the the presidential nomination himself. Sure. Carol Quigley and asked them some specific questions about specific quotes from Tragedy and Hope. Could you imagine putting Bill Clinton on the spot with something like that? Of course, it will never happen in the controlled corporate media, but hey, who knows? Maybe some independent guerrilla journalists will will do some ambush journalism at some point. But anyway, we'll leave that there. And I hope that we've at least gestured towards some of the some of the interesting nuggets. Of course, there are so many more, and your book goes through them, documents them, organizes them, explains them, footnotes them. It is an extremely detailed, extremely organized work. You have obviously put a lot of research into this. And, oh, I forgot to mention, it's free. It is free online to read. So this is an extremely valuable resource at tragedyhope.info. It's completely free. Of course, you can purchase a a copy or a physical and or Kindle uh, via Amazon, help support the person who put this together, and I hope you do. But again, it's a free resource for uh, for getting other people who will not sit down and read a 600,000 word treatise like this, The Tragedy and Hope. Maybe they will read the introduction to this, and it is such an extremely important resource. Tell people again how they can get it and uh, what, what other resources they can use to wake people up to this. Well, I, you hit on one of the, the big things here, which is there is no barrier to entry. This is what I, I wanted, you know, Tragedy and Hope itself, the barrier to entry is the size of the book. Okay, so we've condensed all of the really important stuff down, made it very accessible, and footnoted it so you can go and make sure that nothing's taken out of context. Everything is exactly as it's presented, you know, at the level that you want to do that. But more importantly, you don't have to buy it. You can actually just go start reading it. So people who may be interested but don't really want to pay for it or whatever, they can just go there and they can, they can just start reading it and determine you know, how useful it is to them and do the additional research. And there's also a bonus material section where I've essentially uh, – the bonus material section uh, consists of works about eugenics. So for instance, Richard Lynn, uh, Eugenics, a Reassessment, if you want to talk about the mindset of these people – 
always it's best to go to the sources. So if you want to go to the bonus material link there, you'll see Eugenics a Reassessment and you can start reading through and his book is 150 bucks last time I checked, so most people don't want to pay that. This is probably I'm not sure how many thousand probably let's I'm just going to guess. Uh the excerpts from Tragedy and Hope is 50,000, let's say 50,000 words. Let's say the excerpts from um from Richard Lynn's book, maybe 10, 15,000 words. So it isn't going to take you that, that long to get through it. Uh, NATO's secret armies. You want to learn about Operation Gladio, you can go to the bonus, the bonus material section, click on that, and that's where you'll find all of these uh, additional um, important passages that kind of summarize. Now, this isn't the same as Tragedy and Hope 101. These are actual excerpts from the books, and then hopefully if you read Ganser's excerpts, you'll say, you know what, I would like to get the full book and read it because that's how you get the full story. Exactly yeah. right. But, Again, yeah. more important resources. And I understand you also, as an introductory introduction to the no, en- no, entry, uh, uh, no, no barrier to entry material, you also have uh, bookmarks that people can use. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so here, okay, we got it ready to go. Let's see if we can uh, get it to not be all... Uh, Glossy, but anyway, yeah, these bookmarks are for anybody who wants to hand something out physical to somebody, but they don't want to buy books because that could get pretty expensive. What this does is they can get these very cheap. You can get uh, 50 of them at the site for 10 bucks shipped. So this gives you the ability, it, it provides the summary of the book, provides the URL, tragedyandhope.info. On the back, it explains that you can read it absolutely for free. And uh, if you want to hand something to people, you know, it's, it's a little bit better than just telling them a, a URL, which they may forget. You can, they can put this in their pocket, and, uh, and uh, hopefully it'll make it that much more likely that they'll go check out the information. Absolutely correct. And I, I'm glad, again, that you've taken the time to do this and that this interview has finally come together. It's been a very, very long time in the making. So <laughs> good, good that we finally got into connect. Uh, Joe Plummer, I think we're going to leave it there for today. Thank you again for your time. Thank you for your work. Good speaking with you, James, and thank you for your work.